this episode of United, striking with style, we'll show you how to attack on the soccer field. The science of sleep, we'll talk about how important it is for your body and mind to catch some Z's. And we'll give you tips on writing the perfect outline. United starts now. Welcome to United, I'm Megan Clementi, and I'm here with Amanda Cromwell, the head women's soccer coach for the University of Central Florida. Amanda, we are here to talk about how to strike a soccer ball. So what does it take to have a good shot? Well, a good shot requires good technique, and um, it's the placement of the foot, um, the plant foot next to the ball, um, how you follow through is part of it, just like any other shot, basketball, golf, um, there's a lot of components to it. How important is it? It's very important. Scoring goals is what it's all about in the game of soccer. Um, you can't win if you don't score, so we need the uh, majority of the players to be able to strike the ball very well. What should an athlete keep in mind when developing the technique that goes with learning how to shoot? I think repetition is the biggest thing. Um, they have to get out there and strike balls from distance, close in, inside the foot, um, sometimes bend it with the outside of the foot, use their laces. There's a lot of surfaces you can strike a ball with. It's not just um, just power. There's finesse involved too, so it's, it's technique and repetition of that technique on different surfaces of your foot. Would you consider strength to be one of the number one priorities when developing your shot? No, I don't actually. Uh, you know, you can have a player that weighs 160 and a player that weighs 120, and the 120 pound player can probably maybe be able to hit a ball better um, because of her technique is better. And that's the big thing we stress is um, the follow through, um, the correct placement of your plant foot, keeping your head down, shoulders over the ball. And, um, you know, on the follow through, the weight would come into play if the player had proper technique. Mm -hmm. um, you know, some of the best strikers of all, though, aren't aren't necessarily the strongest people on the field, they have the best technique. What's one of the best habits that you can form when developing your technique? Um, big thing I probably talk about with our players still is following through. Just like, get, that's where you get the, more of the power comes into play, um, and not stepping backwards, uh, but getting that plant foot down, striking through the ball, and keeping your momentum going forward is, is, is huge, and striking the ball very well. Thank you, Coach. How about we go check it out and see how it's really done? My name is Colby Hale. I'm the associate head coach here at UCF for the women's soccer team. Uh, today we're going to be talking about proper technique and form and striking a ball. All the different components of striking a ball properly. The first is going to be the address. Important aspects are going to be your distance to address of the ball. If it's too close, you're going to lack power as you won't be able to have a full leg extension. If it's too far, you're going to have a hard time striking the ball properly and clean. You want your ball to be a good comfortable distance. You want your shoulders to be square. You're going to drive your power from your hips or your core. You want your chest to be over the ball. You want your plant foot to be slightly in front of the ball. You want your toe to be pointed down, your heel to be pointed up. When you strike through the ball, you're gonna drive your power with a good knee snap, land on your shooting foot, and then on balance. A few common mistakes are gonna be your plant foot. A lot of times players will tend to plant too far behind the ball or too far away, too close. Each one of those is gonna affect the power in the direction of the ball. The third one is gonna be players who don't follow through properly. They end either high or they stop on the ball completely. This doesn't allow your leg to fully snap and your follow through to drive your power from your momentum. The third one is gonna be leaning back, which is gonna cause the ball to go over the goal. Another important factor when striking a ball or shooting is gonna be the specific game demands or the situation you find yourself in. If you strike a ball properly with your laces, you will have good power, but sometimes you are going to lack some accuracy. So there are situations where you're using an instep or even an outstep to be the keeper to a certain spot. The instep is going to be the top of your foot. You're going to strike a ball properly. You create good power through your hip, ability to follow through. But you may lack some ability to put the ball exactly where you want. If you're going to use the inside of your foot, you may lose some power, but you will have better uh, control over the accuracy. Another one is going to be the outstep, which is the outside of your foot. You're still going to strike through the center of the ball. Uh, you may have to use this when the ball's put in a weird situation. The defender doesn't allow you to get proper your hips around or the instep to the, fall, to the ball. I'm here today with Emily Maynard. She's a senior from uh, Chicago, Illinois. She's here to help us demonstrate some of the proper technique in the setup. 
uh, when adjusting the ball to strike it properly. Emily's gonna demonstrate she's beating the player cleanly. She's inside or near the proximity of the top of the box. Because of it, she's able to sacrifice some power in premium of placing the ball inside the corner of the net. Sometimes in the context of a game, the ball will get caught underneath your feet, which doesn't allow you to use your laces or the inside of your foot. At this point, you would want to use the outside of your foot to bend it around a keeper and place it in the corner. Emily's beating her player. She's got caught just a little bit underneath. She's going to bend the ball to the far post. You're still going to strike through the center of the ball to derive your power, but you will be playing the ball away from the keeper. A lot of times, the game demands don't allow for a player that's running properly onto a ball, hips aimed the proper direction. So it's important to work on all different angles when shooting technique. We're going to play a ball through Emily's feet. She's going to run on, be running away from goal. She's going to get her hips around. She's going to hit it on frame. Important aspects of this are to hit slightly on top of the ball. You hit the center of the ball or above it, the ball will have a tendency to rise and go over. This is on working on shooting balls from different angles and directions. You notice how Emily still works to get her hips around and her plant foot aiming the ball. She hits on top of, slightly on top of the ball, which keeps the ball nice and low. She still runs through it, she still lands on her shooting foot. The only direct difference is she has to get her hips around at a more difficult angle. If you didn't have someone to play a ball through your feet, it's simple, you just start yourself here, you knock a ball out square, and you finish it yourself. We've worked on different aspects and different angles and different drills that you can do to work on your shooting. Um, and we wish you all the best from UCF. It looks like Coach Hale gave us some really great tips. We just need to remember about repetition of the proper technique. Yes, we do. We'll see you back on United after the break. Did you know that not getting enough sleep can affect more than just the way you feel in the morning? Your body's growth and development, brain size, and immune system can all be affected by your sleeping habits. Stay tuned to United because later in the show, we'll share a few tips that'll make getting a proper amount of sleep easier. You've always heard that a good night's rest is important, but how much does it really matter? As some student athletes can tell you, the difference between success and failure can depend on some old-fashioned Jedi. Sleep is very important, especially um, competing at the Division I level, um, trying to balance academics and the athletics. Uh, sleep takes a toll on you if you don't have enough. I mean, if you want to be a Division I athlete and perform at the highest level, then you need to do whatever it takes to get there. And that part of that is taking care of your body and getting good sleep so you can perform when, you know, colleges are out there watching you and um, in the classroom too, because if you're not making the grades in high school, you're not gonna get to the next level. When I get sleep, I just feel so good in the morning. Like I'm ready to go to work. I'm ready to go to weights, I'm ready to go to class. I mean, when I get sleep, I have the energy to study, like, whereas some days, I, if I don't get enough sleep, I get from class, I probably just want to lay down or just waste time playing video games or watching TV. Um, you struggle to pay attention in classes, it's harder to focus at practice, and it's a lot more challenging to stay in tune to what's going on. You no, know, like, whereas in football, if you don't get enough sleep and you're tired, you know, you're not going to go hard every play. And, when you're not going hard, that's normally when you get hurt. That's when the <clears throat> most amount of injuries occur, when you're not going full speed. And if you're tired, you're not going to go full speed every play. Uh, sleeping is just as important as taking your reps out on the field, whether it's baseball, football, whatever sport it is. As teammates, we're all holding each other accountable to perform on the field. And if you have certain athletes on your team that aren't performing, um, you kind of hold them accountable for not taking care of themselves because of the fact that everybody else is doing it, so they need to pull their weight too. The team is a chain. Each person is a link. If my link is broken, then the whole chain is broken. But if I'm not getting sleep, then I'm taking my time out of the day to get caught up on sleep, whereas I can be watching film at that time. You know, it can just ruin that through the week. Like, say I'm not watching film on this day, I take a day off, or I'll watch it tomorrow. That's one day of preparation that I'm missing that could have helped me in the game, or I ain't watched that play on film, and I blew it right there. I think our biggest reward as a student athlete is that we're here for two main reasons, and that's to get good grades and perform in our sport. So we're having the sacrifice a few nights of going out to you know, accomplish what we came here to do, then that's worth it to me. You have to take sacrifices. I know everybody wants to go hang out and have some fun, but when it comes down to the most important thing for yourself, 
and for the team, for the team to win, uh, you might have to sacrifice and stay in that night and catch up on some sleep. There's a, there's time and place for everything, and when you're at college, you just you need to focus on what you're here for, what the coaches brought you here to do, and you want to go to sleep. You want your sleep when you're here. <laughs> We all know that sleep is a necessity, but with academics, sports, and a social life, sometimes sleep can lose its importance to a student athlete. When we come back, we'll hear from a doctor who will share the benefits and consequences that surround our nightly rest. Time for our United Trivia question. Which activity do some doctors recommend doing before bed to help you sleep easier? Is it watching TV, reading a book, playing video games, or talking on the phone? Stay tuned after the break for the answer. It's time for the answer to this episode's trivia question. Which activity do some doctors recommend doing before bed to help you sleep easier? The answer is reading a book. Television and other electronic devices can stimulate the brain and make getting to sleep more difficult for many people. A relaxing book can be just the thing some people need to put their mind to rest. Welcome back. I'm here with Dr. Monette from the North Seminole Family Practice and one of the team physicians here at the University of Central Florida. Today, you're going to be discussing the, the habits of sleeping patterns with us. I am. So can you kind of tell me the benefits of forming proper sleeping habits earlier in life rather than later? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's good to be here. It's good to see everybody. Um, the thing about uh, sleep is that you want to start off early in life to get good sleeping patterns. Uh, the reason is it's better to maintain and it's going to carry on the older you get <coughs> through life. Um, if you having the TV on, listen to the radio, doing homework late, it's going to start to affect your sleep patterns the older you get, even through college, um, uh, once you get out of college, the job, uh, you're not going to get the right amount of sleep, which really should be anywhere between 8 to 11 hours. Does that amount of time, the 8 to 11 hours, technically like reset the battery inside of you to get you through your day? It actually does. The uh, big thing about not getting the 8 to 11 hours that you can develop was called a sleep debt. And the sleep debt is like having a credit card and accumulating a lot of debt over time. Um, soon you're going to have to pay that off. And so when you're getting maybe five, you know, six hours of sleep, you're missing the two or three hours. It's going to start to catch up to you and be more fatigued. You're not going to be performing well on, on, on and off the field and also with, uh, you know, your academics. So you can kind of compare that to maybe a weekend where you're staying up late and you're not getting enough sleep and then maybe Wednesday you're starting to feel it. Oh, big time. That's, that's exactly what it is. If you're just not getting the sleep, it's going to come back and uh, kind of bite you down the line. How does sleep really hit the bigger picture of mental ability and physical activity? That's a good question because the biggest thing that they found out that it, uh, you, when you're young, it actually affects your growth. It actually affects the size of your brain. Um, and also affects your immunity. So if you're not getting the right amount of sleep when you're younger, it's going to definitely uh, affect you the older you get. And say that you, you know, did get decent sleep uh, when you're um, younger, and now it's, it's going to affect your performance uh, physically, like I said, like on the field, and also on your tests and remembering, uh, you know, test questions. What would you say is the biggest consequence maybe of not getting enough sleep on a pretty fairly often schedule, I guess? Like if you're not getting enough sleep, sleep. a lot. It's it, like, it's gonna definitely affect your performance. I say that's what, probably the biggest, the biggest thing. thing. Yeah, and again, that's not just physical, but also uh, mental. mental. Mm -hmm. So remembering plays, remembering technique, Absolutely. all of that. Yeah, and you're tired, you know, you're gonna set yourself up, not just for uh, th those types of uh, problems, but injury, you know, like blowing out a knee or something because you're just, you know, tired and just not really into the game. Any major recommendations you can give the youth today about sleeping patterns? Yeah, um, definitely stay away from caffeine, the uh, um, Red Bulls, um, ca uh, coffee, um, like any of those dietary supplements, like a hydroxy cut, things like that. They, they're, they're stimulant, they're not going to get you that restful sleep, the uh, non-REM and the REM sleep that, that you need throughout the day um, or through the night. And then the uh, 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 TV, radios, doing homework really late at night, it's gonna, you know, you shouldn't be doing those uh, when you're going to bed, shutting them off, you know, maybe reading a book, life should be good after that. For those kids or teens or adults that 
are having caffeine on a daily basis, do you need to wean yourself off or can you just stop cold turkey? Um, you can stop cold turkey, but you usually get a raging headache. Um, so yeah, it probably, and it, it would also affect your sleep patterns too, um, depending on how much you're doing. If, you know, say you're doing four cups of coffee, I would probably just cut it by a cup uh, every day or every other day. Thank you, Dr. Monette. It was wonderful to have you today. Hey, thank you. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Hey, this is LT from 1011 WJRR. You're listening to the best sounds of area music. UCF Athletics, Access Magazine, and WJRR are proud to support local artists. Hi, welcome back to United. I'm Stephen Helmkamp with Christy Belden, the Associate Director for Academic Services with Student Athletes. Today we're going to be talking about what it takes to make a great academic paper. Christy, what are some of your thoughts? Well, I think outlining is always a great way to start. It gives you um, a basically start point to organize your paper um, and get a lot of the you know, dirty work out of the way very early on. It also helps you feel accomplished. As you complete you know, the first part of your outline, when you write your paper, you can cross that off. And like I said, you can feel accomplished as you complete the different sections in your paper. Now, are there different approaches when a student is writing a one-page paper to, say, a 10-page paper or even longer? Absolutely. I mean, I think it's the same general format that you're going to outline and then list your main topics. But obviously, if it's a 10-page paper, you're going to go into a much more detail. Maybe you list your references, um, and you're going to have, obviously, numerous paragraphs on each topic. Whereas a one-page paper, it's going to be very simple and concise to the point, such that you might say, this is your opening paragraph, what you're going to discuss there, a couple of points each on your you know, middle two to three paragraphs, and then your closing. Nowadays, do you see students using this outline as an advantage when they go to write an academic paper? Absolutely, absolutely. I think nowadays um, it gives students an opportunity to, like I said, organize your paper before you get on the computer ready to type. Now, Christy, what's the biggest mistake you see students make when they're writing their outline? I think two common mistakes. One, they put too little information, such that they say, this is my opening paragraph, this is my middle paragraph, and this is my closing, and don't give any information about what they're actually going to discuss. Or the alternative, people who will literally hand write virtually their entire paper and then have to go and type it word for word into the computer. So you want to make sure that you have that happy medium where you give just enough information about what you're going to cover. Christy, thank you so much for being here. We really appreciate all your tips. Thank you. Now let's go check out what a great academic paper outline really looks like. Uh, how you doing? I'm Sharif Rashad. I was a four-year starter here at UCF uh, for the football team. Hi, my name's Lindsay Black and I'm one of the academic advisors for football. Today we're going to talk about how to outline a paper. There's three points to a paper to remember. First, the introduction, the body, and the conclusion. In the introduction, the most important part is the thesis. This is where you explain what your paper will be about. Uh, from here, you'll be able to map out the rest of your paper. You want to make sure that's a clear, concise thesis. That way, you'll be able to specify exactly what you're going to be talking about. Uh, today, the thesis of our paper is going to be the makeup of a football team. Once you have your thesis, you are now able to write your introductory paragraph. This is where you'll be able to spell out your ideas of what you're going to write later in the body of your paragraph. But just make sure that you stay consistent with your thesis. In the body of your paper, each paragraph is going to have a certain point. Uh, the way I usually like to map it out is with A's, B's, and C's. You're going to start with an A. And the A is going to be the main point of your paragraph. And uh, in this situation, we're going to start with the defense. So you'll start the paragraph off talking about the defense. And from there, you'll break it up into subsections. Uh, if you use A as the main point, you're probably going to want to go with the one, two, and three for the supporting thoughts. And in this instance, our supporting thoughts would be we could have the defensive line, the linebackers, and the defensive backs. One thing to remember when you're writing your body is you don't want to be too specific or too broad. Like Sharif did, he made sure that defense 
was a broad subject, but he can narrow it down. We don't want to narrow it too small because then you're going to be going back over the same material over and over again. The way we did it here, uh, as you can see, you just want to, once again, you want to lay out the heading of each paragraph and then you want to use the one, twos, and threes to support uh, whatever the topic of that paragraph is. Uh, for this, the way it worked was it was the offense was the main point, and then below that you're going to have the offensive line, the quarterbacks, and the running backs, and then we have special teams, and for special teams, your subheadings are going to be kickoff, kickoff return, punt, punt return, and then field goal and PAT. Okay, one thing that you always want to do is you always want to make sure to take the time out to check back and forth and make sure that your format is staying the same throughout your entire outline. And you also want to make sure that all of your thoughts are referring back to your thesis. Now that we've finished our introduction and body, we're going to move on to the conclusion. In the conclusion, you want to make sure that this is where we're going to wrap up all of our thoughts in our paper. We'll start by going back to our thesis because this is what our whole paper is about and just saying some final thoughts about each part of our paper. Also in the conclusion, you just want to make sure that the only thing you're doing is closing all of your thoughts. You don't want to introduce any new ideas. You only want to close the things that you've been addressing in your paper. Thanks for tuning in to Paper Writing 101. I'm Lindsay Black. And I'm Shree Fashai. And hopefully you picked up some tips that'll help you write some good papers in the future. I'll proofread them for you. Well, Chrissy, that's some great tips on what an outline really can do for you. Yes, it really works well, and our student athletes definitely take good advantage of this uh, process, and it usually shows good results. Well, that's all we have this week for United. Thank you for tuning in. I'm Stephen Helmkamp. We'll see you next time. Let's be